Am I audible? Yes, okay. My assignment today is to discuss, and I was given an assignment, I should say, um, and I always follow my assignments. Um, my assignment today is to discuss the Second Vatican Council's formulation of the common good, and also to see how that might be informed, or what light can be shed on it, by earlier Thomistic discussions of the common good, especially the controversy about it in the mid-1940s associated with Charles de Conic and Jacques Maritain. My remarks will be divided like everything since Gaul in trace partes. First, I will discuss the Vatican II formulation. Then I will discuss the disagreement between de Conic and Maritain. Finally, I will return to the Vatican II formulation in light of that Thomistic controversy. And I will now dispel whatever suspense you may feel by anticipating my conclusion, which is that in my view, the Council's account of the common good has little, if anything, to do with the intra Thomistic controversy. <laughs> Moreover, I think that that specific controversy between De Conic and Maritain sheds rather little light on the formulation or on our present circumstances. So, part one. <clears throat> First, the Council's formulation. The common good is discussed and characterized famously in the 1965 pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes, Articles 26 and 74, and in the Declaration on Religious Freedom, Dignitatis Humanae, Article 6. The formulation adopted varies slightly between the three, but the basic elements are clear enough and now well known. Quote, the sum total of conditions according to which individual, individuals and groups can more fully and readily achieve their perfection, unquote. Now, the three are a bit different, and so there is a question which of the formulations, if any, should be given normative priority. I think the formulation in Gaudium et Spes section 74 should be preferred since it's the one that's most firmly contextualized. And it's worth dwelling for a moment on elements of that formulation and about its context because there are some complications, complications and uh, aspects of it that aren't always noticed by people. The first thing to note is that the common good there is said to be a sum of conditions. And this seems problematic in that in the history of Western political thought and in the Catholic tradition, the bonum commune is seen as a final cause of political institutions and practices. To say that the end of the political community is a set of conditions makes the political community seem like a merely instrumental good. Leaving aside the connotations of merely and then and the often underappreciated fact that even instrumental goods can be very important indeed, another aspect of the formulation seems to me to solve this problem. The conditions are said ultimately to be the conditions necessary for individuals and groups to achieve their perfection. The translations of these documents that are on the Vatican website almost invariably translate that last word as fulfillment, which has caused some people no end of apoplectic despair. <laughs> but the Latin text uses the word perfectio. The conditions are said ultimately to be conditions necessary for individuals and groups to achieve their perfection. So here, perfection is actually the final cause. One should note also that the formulation mentions both individuals and groups, and the immediate context explicitly affirms the social nature of man, that is in Article 74, that's the whole context of the thing. So the formulation cannot be conceived in any individualistic way. If we say that the real final cause is perfection, however, that seems to raise another problem, one noted by some theologians. In our contemporary pluralistic societies, perfection is a much controverted notion. The church obviously has its own notion of perfection, but it is not one shared by other faith traditions or citizens with less defined religious beliefs or none at all. Certainly the formulation is meant to be intelligible beyond our own tradition, since the document is intended to be read by people beyond the church. Um, so I think the solution is found in looking back at the notion of conditions. One set of conditions, 
can certainly serve the pursuit of more than one notion of perfection, especially if we have in mind the conditions maintained by specifically political societies. But there is a more serious problem that doesn't necessarily turn on pluralism or disagreement. If we say the final cause is the common good and the very formulation of the common good includes perfection, are we to think that political society and its instrumentalities can bring about the perfection of individuals or groups? The document does not require one to think this, again, because of its focus on conditions. The perfection of individuals is a function of their own free deliberate choices and the free gift of grace. The most that political institutions can do is establish conditions on the basis of which individuals can pursue perfection, both as individual persons and by associating with other persons. There is one other worry about this formulation, although I cannot fully address that until the third part of my remarks. But the basic problem is this. To say that the common good is a set of conditions is not to say what those conditions are. Gaudi Metzpez is not terribly specific here. Although it does mention juridical institutions, the protection of basic rights, and the establishment and maintenance of the socioeconomic conditions appropriate to human flourishing. The 1993 Catechism is a bit more specific in this respect, including among the conditions, the protection of fundamental rights, peace and security, and the development of society itself. One could conclude from this that the conditions are narrowly material. And this again suggests the prioritizing of a kind of instrumentality. Here it is important to notice a feature of the formulation given uh, specifically in Article 74 of Gaudium et Spes, but not elsewhere in the council documents. The common good is said to include the sum total of conditions. The Latin verb there is complector. But the formulation does not make these conditions exhaustive of the common good. This suggests a point first made, but rarely noticed thereafter, so far as I can tell, by the great Jesuit student of Catholic social teaching, Oswald Bonnell Breuning, in his commentary on Gaudium Espez, the one that came out shortly after the council in that big set of commentaries edited by Herbert Fordrimler. He argued that the formulation of the common good there should be understood as indicating an, as it were, lower level of the common good but not to be a statement of the common good as such in its completeness. He thought this partial conception was aimed at explaining specifically political society, but that the common good in the fullest sense transcends this. Why would the council focus on this limited sense of the common good? I shall return to this in the third part of my remarks, but now I want to turn to De Connick and Mary Tan. So part two, <clears throat> in 1943, Charles de Connick, the Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy at Laval University in Quebec, published a short book, really it was two essays that he put together, called On the Primacy of the Common Good, which aimed to explain the authentic views of St. Thomas Aquinas on the nature of the common good, and especially to emphasize its transcendence. But the book's title went on to indicate the reason for his exposition of St. Thomas's account of the common good at that time on the primacy of the common good against the personalists. This made it both an exposition and a polemic. The polemic was directed at a relatively undefined and in fact quite various trend, it could not be called a school, trend of thinking in the 1930s that emphasized understanding personhood and defending the priority of the person against perceived threats to it at that time especially the political threats issuing from both the extreme political right and the extreme political left, and especially in the context of modern technology. For De Connick, the primacy of the common good meant most importantly the primacy of God as the universal good and the final end of every created thing. In addition to this, De Connick understood the order of the universe and of human society to be common goods by analogy. It is important that the common good be understood both as really good and really common. The goodness indicates its status as a final cause contributing to the perfection of persons. The commonness also indicates its goodness since as Thomas says repeatedly, the more common a good is, the more good it is. The common good then must be understood as common in the right way. Not common to conic emphasized by predication like health as a good for individuals 
or like a genus common to members. Rather, it must be causally common, a thing one in number, <clears throat> but the causality of which extends to many effects. The analogy Thomas usually uses, or the image he usually uses, is the sun. <clears throat> what particularly threatened this primacy in contemporary personalism was the seeming idea that it is the human person that is actually primary, which entailed two specific notions. First, personalism, as de Kahnik had understood, it conceives of the final end, even within a Christian context, the beatific vision, as really a private good, the good of the person as an individual. Second, common goods are seen as essentially instrumental to the good of person. In both cases, the individual person seems to be the end, and the implication of this, and this is what DeConnick really meant to expose, was that the individual person is his or her own end. Now, by contrast, St. Thomas held that the common good was part of the good of the individual person. The goodness of the common good was transcendent precisely because of its commonness, that is, it really is the good of everything and everyone. There is nothing private about it. Moreover, it is an error to conceive of the common good as a kind of commonality or super individual standing against the private goods of individual persons. In this case, the common good would really not be a part of the good of the individual, but rather an alien good. And a tension necessarily would arise between the private good and the common good. This view of society as having a good of its own, standing against the private good of separate individuals, is a modern view, DeConnick held, associated with secular states, especially the totalitarian states of the 1940s, although liberal societies also sometimes fall victim to it. If the goal of the, person, of the personalist was to defend the dignity of the human person, DeConnick held, this view could never do since uh, the rivalry between the private goods of persons and the common good of a collective would inevitably end in the victory of the latter and the total absorption of individual persons. The good of political society must therefore be understood as open to and subordinated to the transcendent common good that is God. The alternative was a radically separate political order composed of individuals but aimed at welding them into some kind of human mass. Now, there is one important aspect of DeConnick's book that most led to the ensuing controversy. While the book was aimed at criticizing personalism, it actually named very few personalists and referred really to almost no specific pers actual personalist arguments. At the same time, the most well-known Catholic intellectual in the world had for some years been identifying himself in his own view precisely as personalism, Jacques Maritain. Maritain had been writing about the person since at least 1925 and identifying his own political philosophy as personalist since at least 1936. Perhaps the single most important such statement was his 1939 Denneke lecture given at Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford University and quickly published, first as a pamphlet and then as an essay included in Maritain's 1940 book, Scholasticism and Politics, and finally, slightly revised, composing the core of his 1946 book, The Person and the Common Good. If one can identify a main thesis in this work of Maritain's, it is that society is for the sake of the development of the human person. This thesis was meant to be a solution to the problem of the relationship between the person and society, a problem made practical by the politics of the time and the political theories of fascist collectivism, Marxist collectivism, and liberal individualism, all of which Maritain rejected. Moreover, personhood was understood by Maritain to refer, but by reference to a distinction he made, a famous distinction between person and individual. Personhood, for Maritain, indicated a spirituality that was generous <clears throat> and that sought society out of love. Individualism, by contrast, indicated the materiality and separateness of human beings and sought society primarily out of need. Maritain's solution to the basic problem was that insofar as human beings were individuals, they constitute parts of society, and so far as they are persons, they constitute the ends of society. The two collectivisms say that human beings are only material parts, 
Liberal individualism saw them as ends, but only as individuals and as material beings. Accordingly, society was either itself the end of human life or it was a mere means. Now, as I said, the fact that Maritain identified his own view as personalism certainly led most readers of DeConnick's book to assume that Maritain was his principal target. Yves Simone was only the first prominent reader to draw this conclusion. And about this, I want to make two points. First, if the core of the view DeConnick aimed to reject was that the ultimate transcendent common good was a private good and that the temporal common good was merely an instrumental good, then Jacques Maritain could not have been his target, for Maritain never held either of those views. Other personalists surely did. But while Maritain's writings could be rather, well, let's just call it sloppy and imprecise at times, he never held these views. To allow oneself to be understood as indicating that he did would have been, as Simone charged, unjust. Now, DeConnick never said that those were Maritain's views, but he also never denied it. There was, however, this complication, a complication that led the affair beyond a frontier of acrimony that might have better been left unbreached. Ignatius Eschmann, a Dominican medievalist exiled from Nazi Germany and working in the Pontifical Institute for Medieval Studies at the University of Toronto, undertook to make a quasi-official reply to DeConnick in an article entitled In Defense of Jacques Maritain and published in The Modern Schoolman in 1945. The article astonishingly, astonishingly defended Maritain by defending precisely, at least some precisely, of the theses that Taconic attributed to personalism. But that I just asserted, Maritain never held. Both Maritain and Simone were beside themselves, and we know this because all of the correspondence between Maritain and Simone had been published. Um, although the fact that Eschmann seemed to have penned his article out of friendship made them ill-disposed to repudiate it or him. Maritain's only acknowledgement of DeConnick's attack and Eschmann's unfortunate defense was a cryptic footnote in The Person and the Common Good. DeConnick, by contrast, reacted by turning the launch keys on a retaliatory strike so massive that it would have made Herman Kahn blush. The opinion of those who have fought their way through the materials of this controversy, and it does require a machete of great sharpness, is almost unanimous in the opinion that DeConnick's reply was devastating. Perhaps sensing this, DeConnick never addressed the matter again. In fact, I believe he never spoke in public or presented an academic paper again. But all of this is something of a peripheral aspect of the main point that I repeat, Maritain did not hold the views that DeConnick attacked. My second point is an observation in two parts. <clears throat> First, if anything separated Maritain and DeConnick, it was that Maritain's concern in articulating his own views were always more practical than speculative. And DeConnick's concerns were always more speculative than practical. To some degree, then, they talked past one another. The second part of that point, which I take to be supportive of the first point, is that if one examines the practical political views of Maritain and DeConnick about contemporary political institutions and problems, what one finds is that their views are not very different from one another. DeConnick was a strong advocate of religious freedom and of federalism in Canada. He wrote a splendid, very long, uh, well, it was kind of a memorandum that was intended for a Canadian government con commission that was studying the fiduciary and financial relationships between the national government and the provincial governments. Um, and part of the title of it was Contre le Grand État against the great state, or the big state. So he was a strong advocate of religious freedom and of federalism in Canada. As I say, he was an expert advisor to the Tremblay con uh, Commission, which produced a study and recommendations about the future of federalism in Canada. DeConnick's contribution was a paper in which he described the provinces as complete communities on the basis of Thomistic Aristotelian political theory, and accordingly insisted on limitations of the national government. This echoed DeConnick's characterization of the modern state in um, the primacy of the common good as a kind of uh, 
on, in, in largely Hobbesian terms. I mean, that's the way he described it in the book. This way of thinking about modern states was similar to Maritain's view, as spelled out in his last great political work, Man and the State, in which he described the state as a kind of machine, as distinguished from the larger political society understood as a natural community. For Maritain, the common good was not instrumental. It was, as he repeatedly said, a bonum anestum, the goal of political community. The state, however, was a juridical entity with a Weberian monopoly on the legitimate use of coercive force. It was necessary, but not very attractive, and could be characterized precisely as an instrument. Maritain used that term, and that term was also used specifically to describe the state later by Pius XII in Summi Pontificatus, 1939, and John Paul II towards the beginning of Centesimus Annus. So, part three. <clears throat> I suggested at the end of my first section that we should see Gaudium et Spes's characterization of the common good as a partial characterization of the common good, focused on specifically political society. But the last point about De Conic and Maritain puts us in a position to see why that partial characterization of the common good was given such prominence. The answer has a lot to do with the nature of the modern state that both Maritain and De Conic saw in rather negative terms. The formulation of the common good in the council documents was certainly in them because it was the formulation that had been adopted by St. John XXIII in Mater et Magistra in 1961 repeated in Pacem Terrace in 1963. I mean, that's the simplest thing. I mean, why is that formulation in Gaudium? It's, well, it's been there because that was the state of the art in John's uh, magisterium. Now, this might suggest that that formulation, however, was an innova uh, innovation of John XXIII, but it was not. Indeed, that way of describing the common good was already something of a commonplace in Catholic thought by 1961. I use the term commonplace because we can find that formulation in exactly the sort of place one always finds commonplaces, in textbooks. It was given as the definition of the common good in a handbook on Catholic social teaching published by the French bishops for use in seminaries in 1954. And the notes to that discussion refer mostly to speeches given by Pius XII, where one can indeed find it. It's also in a textbook on moral theology, Morale Fundamentale, by the great medievalist Odin Lotan. He uses the same formation, uh, formulation there a little bit later, but certainly before John XXIII. Pius XII was the first pope to embrace this formulation, although there are already intimations of it in the work of Pius XI. The origin of it, however, the literal origin, I think of the materials that are precisely given in that phrase, is the work of the Jesuit moralist, Victor Catherine who lived from 1845 to 1931. Although it reflects, in fact, more than just Catherine, it reflects the work of the community in which Catherine studied and worked, the Jesuit studium at Maria Locke in the Rhineland. And I think one can find the roots of it in the work of Catherine's teacher, Theodore Meyer, who lived from 1821 to 1913. That community at Maria Locke was particularly concerned with social and political thought and the reason for this, I think, was the fact that they were working in Germany in the middle of the 19th century, in the wake of the revolutions of 1848 and the rise, precisely, of the modern national state. Their community was ultimately shuttered during the Kulturkampf, but they were already trying to understand the consequences of the increasingly centralizing and overawing power of the modern state, and to understand it from the perspective of Thomistic moral and political thought which they were reacquiring thanks to their earlier Italian confrere Luigi Taparelli de Zelio. The basic elements of the Vatican II formulation can all be found in one place or another in Taparelli's sprawling treatise on natural law published in the 1840s. Although, as I said, it was Catherine who assembled them in their now familiar form. It's, it's Catherine's formulation also that appears in Heinrich Pesch's uh, Lehrbuch der Nationale Economie, which was influential on uh, all of the drafters of Rerum Novarum. They made their way from Catherine's work into the right writings of Pius XII, I am reasonably certain, by way of Pius's main advisor on social questions, another Jesuit, Gustav Gundlach, who lived from 1892 to 1963, 
who also, as it happens, penned the very first draft of Mater et Magistra, although it was substantially rewritten by others. Gundlach was an advisor to Pius XI, but he was much closer to Pius XII. He frequently wrote speeches for Pius XII. After the speeches were given on the radio, Gundlach would write articles interpreting them in theological terms. <laughs> he was in a rather good position to do that. Um, Gaudium et Spes's way of describing the common good then was intended to be political and to address specifically modern political problems. Those associated with a modern state, a very different kind of community from the Aristotelian polis or the medieval kingdom or any of the other many medieval forms, there were many, uh, the high degree of centralization, the concentration of lethal power and the sheer size of modern political communities driven often by secular and secularizing ideologies posed a threat to the human person and to the church Modern Catholic social teaching aims to protect the dignity of the human person and the freedom of the church by emphasizing the moral limits on the modern state as a political form. To do this, it appropriated the work of German Jesuit social thinkers already concerned about these issues, just as the tidal wave was about to overtake them. It is for this reason, I would say, that their work sheds rather more light on the dispute between Deconic and Maritain than that dispute sheds on their work. In the, conditions, uh, in the conclusions of the Second Vatican Council. Their experiences made the problem inescapable and practical in a way that was not the case for philosophers. Nevertheless, they clearly saw their work as part of the Thomistic revival and the development of Catholic social teaching, which were intimately connected to one another in the thinking of their initiator, Pope Leo XIII, who founded this university, where we continue the work that he began. Thank you. <clears throat>